19-year-old Melanie was heading home in a sour mood. She had been employed as a nurse at a clinic for a month, but still struggled to adapt to the ward's atmosphere. Her work was monotonous, filled with the same daily tasks, and the constant exposure to human pain and suffering did nothing to lift her spirits. Moreover, the materialistic conversations of her colleagues, always centered around money, expensive gifts, and luxury, left her cold. Discussions about the human soul, morality, empathy, or compassion were conspicuously absent. Melanie was hurrying back, as it was getting late. She had stayed longer at work than usual, consumed by thoughts of eventually finding a more fulfilling job and being part of a team that shared her values and outlook. Late autumn cast a gloomy ambience outside, mirroring the despondency Melanie felt within her soul. The last bus had departed long ago, compelling Melanie to resort to the subway for her journey home. Descending the underpass stairs, she encountered a slender man in tattered, dirty clothing, leaning against the wall, his hand trembling as he sought a bit of spare change. A beggar, she assumed. Reflecting on her own humble upbringing in a fatherless, financially strained family, where her mother toiled in three jobs to provide for them, Melanie couldn't help but feel a genuine sympathy for the man. The girl took a few steps towards him, and upon approaching, she realized the man possessed a nice face with regular features. Intrigued, Melanie scrutinized him more closely. For a moment, she believed she had come across her ex-boyfriend, Anton, whom she had genuinely liked. They had been in a long-lasting relationship, only to part ways in a painful breakup. Melanie called out to the man, and he glanced up briefly before quickly lowering his eyes. It was indeed Anton. The girl sensed his embarrassment at finding himself in such a situation, and it tugged at her heart. Even in this circumstance, she found him endearing. Throughout their time apart, Melanie had secretly harbored hopes of a reunion, and now, unexpectedly, it had occurred. Despite her deep affection for Anton, her mother had vehemently opposed their relationship, perpetually criticizing him as unsuitable, deeming him poor and lacking promise. The unrelenting reproaches eventually led to their painful separation, leaving Anton deeply wounded by everyone around him. What a coincidence, I recognized you and I'm so glad to see you, Melanie babbled excitedly. The young man responded, Lady, you are mistaken. Unfortunately, I am not who you think. My name is Jack. His words were barely audible, and he turned away, but Melanie kept gazing at him, an idea forming in her mind. What if she brought him home, despite her mother's disapproval, and claimed he was her fiancé who would be living with them? Maybe then her mother would stop meddling in her personal life and trying to set her up with suitable candidates. The idea was certainly outrageous, and Melanie could already envision the tremendous scandal it would create at home. However, given her particularly foul mood that day, she was almost tempted to go through with it, just for the sake of doing something drastic. Determined, she bought a coffee and a bun, and offered them to the man. He accepted them with an embarrassed gratitude, eating eagerly. Meanwhile, Melanie began to question him, intrigued by the thought of her wild plan. Jack, how did you end up here? Why aren't you working, and where is your home? Melanie inquired. The embarrassed boy hesitated but eventually shared, yeah, that's how it happened. I don't really want to talk about it. My mother, she drank a lot, and my stepdad brought me here. He beat me to pieces, the house was in ruins, and then they kicked me out. So, I've been wandering around, no documents to find a job. I sleep wherever I can, at the train station or on heating pipes, like everyone else. Melanie felt a sudden surge of empathy for the man who had lost everything. Without second thoughts, she impulsively said, come with me. I'll feed you, give you a bath, and you can sleep. Just one condition, you play along and pretend to be my fiancé. Otherwise, my mother won't let me in. If you don't like it or change your mind, you're free to leave any time. No one is stopping you. Please help me. I really need it. My mother has been unbearable. She won't let me meet anyone, and she keeps dreaming that I'll bring home a millionaire on a white horse. 
The stranger hesitated for a moment and then responded, so, you decided to spite her and bring a bum? Well, it's not such a bad idea. Thank you for the offer. You've got a good heart. I think I'll take it. I'm freezing out here on the crosswalk, at least I'll warm up a bit. Melanie's spirits lifted, and suddenly, everything around her seemed brighter. Melanie was a deeply emotional person, guided by feelings she had never imagined. She hadn't dreamed of a fairy tale marriage or a wealthy bridegroom, she believed that, among young people, love and understanding should take precedence. Mulling over the situation, she thought, what if this is my destiny? She decided she would tell her mother outright that he was her fiancé. Regardless of what unfolded, Melanie was determined to prioritize her own happiness. With unwavering resolve, she took the bewildered Jack and confidently walked towards her envisioned future, despite the astonished onlookers. Melanie's mother, however, did not greet her daughter and the stranger warmly, as expected. Suffering from high blood pressure and having experienced a previous heart attack, she was now on disability and needed heart surgery to replace a valve. The daunting question remained, where would she find the funds for such a procedure? Life was already challenging for Melanie's mother, and her greatest wish was to witness her daughter lead a prosperous life. Despite the unexpected turn of events, Melanie's bold move was about to bring a new chapter into their lives, challenging the status quo and possibly paving the way for unforeseen opportunities. Emma had spent her life struggling financially, taking on various part-time jobs just to afford basic necessities like food and utilities. Over time, this constant struggle took a toll on her health, leading to numerous ailments. She was determined to prevent her daughter, Melanie, from experiencing a similar harsh life. In her younger years, Emma had experienced a profound love, which ended tragically, leaving her pregnant and alone. Her dream was for her daughter to live a life of luxury, married to a successful businessman, which would allow Emma to pass away peacefully, knowing Melanie was well cared for. However, Emma was stunned when she saw who Melanie brought home. The man was disheveled, with dirty clothes and an unkempt appearance. Emma's face displayed a mix of emotions, ranging from surprise to indignation, but Melanie seemed unfazed, calmly introducing the unkempt stranger to her mother. Mother, mother, I'd like you to meet Jack. This is my fiancé, Jack. He and I are going to live here now, he has no place. You don't mind, do you? Turning to the boy, the girl said cheerfully, well, why are you standing there like that? Come on in, don't be shy. Make yourself at home. The mother added angrily, but don't forget you're a guest, Jesus, daughter. When are you going to stop picking up all the trash? This is a decent apartment, not a shelter for the homeless. The woman sighed sorrowfully and hunched over, went to her room. Melanie fried potatoes and mushrooms, the young couple ate a hearty dinner. Then she escorted Jack to the bathroom, threw his dirty clothes in the machine, and showed him to his room. Here's where you'll sleep, right next to him on the cot. I'll make you a bed. Jack enjoyed the hot shower, a clean bed, and thought to himself, what a beauty. That's when you start to appreciate the simple human pleasures. Who would have thought I'd have to experience all this? He looked gratefully at Melanie before going to bed, saying earnestly, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Good night, my fairy. Jack got the hang of his visit pretty quickly, and the kindness of the girl played a positive role. Melanie wasn't bad-looking either, smiling, easygoing, and personable. The young people got along very well, talking at length. Jack tried to help out around the house, he mended the long-delayed loose clotheslines on the balcony, screwed up the sagging cabinets in the kitchen, and propped up rickety chairs. Melanie now ran home as fast as she could, knowing their Jack was waiting for her. The feelings between them had erupted quite unexpectedly. That evening, while they were watching a soap opera and chatting about various things, Melanie suddenly cried out in pain, alarming Jack. Melanie, what's wrong with you? Are you in pain? What is it? He asked worriedly. Melanie grabbed her leg, boops, boops, a cramp, I guess. I've been running around a lot on my shift. Oh, how it hurts. 
Jack removed his slipper and began to gently knead her foot, then the other, and then her shins. The relief was immediate, the pain subsided, and the cramp released its grip. As Jack continued his gentle care, moving higher up her leg, he suddenly moved closer and kissed Melanie passionately and skillfully. Melanie tried to pull away, whispering, Jack, what are you doing? We're supposed to be the bride and groom, stop it. I thought this was just pretend. But I'm in love, he answered softly, continuing to caress her gently. Melanie, I want you so much. You're the best. I've never met anyone like you. If you don't mind, just say the word, and I'll go right away. But by then, it was too late. Melanie had already lost her head, and both plunged into the abyss of passion, oblivious to anything around them. The young couple was absolutely happy, and even their mother's eternal discontent didn't irritate them at all. Jack was so deeply in love with Melanie that he couldn't imagine life without her. As for Melanie, she realized that she had found her happiness. It is genuine love, and I am incredibly happy with him. She went to great lengths to persuade her mother, but her mother remained unwavering. Daughter, what are you doing? What kind of future do you have with him? He's a, underscore underscore, no papers, no house. Do you think he'll still be here in a week? Even though Jack helped his mother in every way, took care of her, and did all the chores, the man's hands were badly needed. Despite his efforts, the woman still hated him, scolding him every time she tried to hit me and hurt me more when Jack hadn't left after a week. The pensioner decided to go for Brooke while Melanie was at work. She informed Jack directly, furiously adding, Melanie's a crazy girl, she's just fooling around with you. In fact, she has a fiancé who's on a trip abroad. He'll be back, and she'll kill them both. Get out of here immediately if you want to live, Otherwise, I'll send Melanie a telegram today. The mother knew that she was casting a dark shadow on her daughter's reputation, but the desire to see her with a wealthy man prevailed. The boy took the woman's word seriously, his eyes brimming with pain and suffering. He covered his face with his hands and wept silently, struggling to believe what he had been told. Could Melanie, who had so earnestly assured him of her love, have been so cruel? Had she betrayed him? He felt petrified, his legs barely moving as he staggered away, not even looking back. That day, Melanie, by a twist of fate, had to stay overnight at the hospital. Her afternoon shift extended when a young boy with severe burns was brought in, and she was asked to stay until morning. She called home to inform them of her 24-hour delay. Her mother, having just ousted the so-called ragamuffin, didn't mention this to Melanie. Instead, she was inwardly pleased, thinking that in 24 hours, he would be far away. Jack, regretting his hasty departure, wished he had waited to speak to Melanie in person. The pain and confusion consumed him, leaving him to wonder why and how this had happened to him. But then, his self-esteem surged, and he decided. I'll go away, I won't trouble myself or her. Let them live as they want. What am I to them? I'm just a bum. These thoughts circled in Jack's mind as he made his decision to leave, believing he was unwanted and unloved. When Melanie finally arrived home and discovered Jack's absence, she immediately understood what had happened. In distress, she confronted her mother, Mom, why? I know you kicked him out. Are you doing this on purpose? I love Jack, do you understand? Where am I going to find him now? Her mother defensively retorted, it's always my fault with you. Your, underscore underscore, left on his own. I didn't touch him. I won't cry for him. Once you've fallen in love, you'll fall out of love. Maybe after the third time, you'll find a normal fiancé. How many times can you bring all kinds of trash home? What kind of girl do you think you are? Melanie was in shock, she knew Jack wouldn't have left on his own, especially when everything between them was going so well. In tears, she lamented, I can only imagine what my mother must have said about me. Where am I going to find Jack now? I can't do it without him. Determined to find Jack and explain everything, Melanie rushed out, 
heading straight to the passage where they first met. Frantically, she inquired about Jack from other tramps and peddlers in the area, but they could only shrug their shoulders in response. They hadn't seen the boy for a long time. Melanie spent an hour frantically searching the outskirts, hoping Jack might still be nearby, waiting for her. But her efforts were futile, he had seemingly vanished into thin air. She felt a deep sense of hurt. Why hadn't he waited to talk to her? He had professed his love, yet he had abruptly left her. Caught in a torrential downpour, with sharp gusts of wind stripping the trees of their remaining leaves, Melanie was oblivious to the weather. She wandered aimlessly, soaked to the bone, sobbing uncontrollably. Doubts crept in. Maybe my mother's right. Maybe I am flawed. Maybe love isn't worth it when it only brings tears. You can't trust anyone, she thought despairingly. Stricken with illness, Melanie lay bedridden for three weeks, suffering from a high fever. In her delirium, she repeatedly called out Jack's name, searching for him. After recovering, she fell into a deep depression. She mechanically went to work, and when at home, she shut herself off from the world. Adding to her turmoil, she discovered she was pregnant. Tormented by thoughts of what to do and how to continue living, Melanie was lost. Despite her despair, she maintained a routine. Every morning and evening, on her way to and from work, she visited the crossing where they first met, holding on to a sliver of hope that she might find Jack. One day, thinking she recognized him from behind, she called out joyfully. Jack, Jack. At last, I found you, Melanie exclaimed, but a complete stranger turned to her, stating, I'm not Jack, you're mistaken. In desperation, Melanie felt compelled to do something irreversible, seeing no other way out with a child under her heart. This way, all the problems would be solved in one fell swoop, out of sight, out of mind. She went to the gynecologist, underwent the necessary tests, and was allowed through without waiting in line. As she lay on the chair, the stern doctor, clearly judging her, took out the instruments needed. Suddenly, a terrible thought struck her, what am I doing? I'm going to kill Jack, the baby. It's a part of him, his blood and flesh. This baby will remind me all my life of my dearest person. How am I supposed to live after that? What is the meaning of life? She pondered. Driven by anger towards everyone, her mother, Jack, and the colleagues who openly laughed at her, she declared, forget them all. I don't care. I'm going to have a baby and raise him myself against all odds. In a decisive moment, Melanie pushed the doctor away, got up from the chair, and said, I'm sorry, I changed my mind. The relieved gynecologist said, thank God. Come back in a week to get registered, but please don't take too long. Melanie returned home after her shift, and immediately the smell of fried fish hit her nose. She barely had time to cover her mouth and rush to the bathroom. After gargling for half an hour, Melanie's disturbed mother, suspecting the worst, listened at the door and screamed, Honey, are you sick? Are you poisoned? Open the door, it's not what I think, is it? Exhausted, Melanie finally opened the door, and her mother stood there, looking reproachfully, waiting for an explanation. In an angry outburst, the tired woman shouted, Mother, I am pregnant. Imagine, such a fool, and from Jack. And you threw him out. Now your grandson will never know who his father is. I hope you're happy. Isn't that what you wanted? Defiantly, Melanie declared, I'm not going to have an abortion. Don't even start that song. Leave me alone, I have to lie down. She ran into the room sobbing. Emma, her mother, grabbed her heart and went to the kitchen to take some sedatives, mentally scolding her daughter for repeating her fate. What a fool, playing in love, repeating my fate. Silly, stepping on the same rake. And now what? Breathe poverty again. I barely got her up, I thought I'd get some peace in my old age. And now I have to raise my grandson without a father. From that day on, Melanie and her mother almost stopped talking. Melanie withdrew into herself and rarely left her room. 
she would try not to cry, and when in dire straits, she'd start singing softly or talking to the baby. Oddly enough, it helped, and she would begin to calm down and fall asleep. Emma deeply regretted lying to her daughter and driving Jack away. She acknowledged that Jack was actually a decent person, he wasn't a drinker and his love for Julia was unmistakable. If only he had his papers and a job, her daughter would have had both a husband and a father for her child. Now, she was tormented by the thought of how to explain her daughter's situation, my daughter is pregnant by a man who disappeared. What will the neighbors think? Melanie's condition worsened, she was constantly vomiting and could hardly eat. At work, she faced relentless taunting and mockery. Her colleagues insensitively speculated about her pregnancy, suggesting she got pregnant too soon without knowing the father. The older nurses were especially cruel, relishing in the salacious details of Melanie's predicament. Behind their backs, the gossip continued, reflecting a judgmental attitude towards young people's sexual behaviors. The situation was a painful reminder of the harsh judgment society often passes on personal matters, especially those involving women's sexuality and reproductive choices. Melanie found herself in a state of frustration, grappling with the notion that marriage was off the table. In her era, intimacy seemed like an alien concept, with people materializing out of thin air, free from the heartbreaks and rejections that plagued relationships. She couldn't help but dismiss them as a group of overly moralistic individuals. Amidst this emotional turmoil, the only source of solace for Melanie was the gynecologist, Harry, who consistently treated her with kindness. He had a unique way of lifting her spirits, never resorting to scolding or moralizing. Instead, he would lock the door, inviting her to share a comforting moment over tea, chocolate, or even a pickle, a gesture she deeply appreciated. Melanie, struggling with sensitivity and hormonal fluctuations, often found herself in tears at the office. However, Harry urged her to distance herself from the overwhelming emotions, recommending walks and conversations with her son. He assured her that the unborn child could sense and react to her feelings. In a reassuring tone, Harry painted a hopeful picture of motherhood, emphasizing that the challenges she faced would fade away once the baby was born. He acknowledged the difficulties but offered his unwavering support, assuring Melanie that she could always reach out for help. I'm ready to put everything aside and be there for you. Save my phone number and call me after each doctor's visit. After making this promise, Melanie found a renewed sense of purpose. Two more months unfolded in a similar fashion, each passing day filled with thoughts of Jack. Despite the anger she harbored towards him, her love for him remained unwavering. Every time she closed her eyes, Jack's hands, lips, and smile flooded her thoughts. Frustrated with herself, she scolded her own emotions, urging herself to let go and forget him. But no matter how hard she tried, the memories and feelings persisted. The realization hit her like a ton of bricks, he had left. He had moved on, seemingly indifferent not bothering to seek her out or show any concern. If his love had been genuine, like hers, he would have made an effort to find her, to communicate with him. She chastised herself for the months spent in a daze, questioning her own actions. It all started so spontaneously, meeting him at a crosswalk, taking his hand. Now, she faced the consequences alone, acknowledging the reality of becoming a single mother. But it wasn't an uncommon path. Her own mother had raised her single-handedly, and she knew she was capable of doing the same. Emma, meanwhile, was acutely aware of the rift between her and her daughter. She knew that unless she apologized and revealed the truth, their relationship would remain strained. Exhausted by the situation, she longed for reconciliation with Melanie. Since their last tense conversation, Melanie had become withdrawn, unresponsive to any attempts at communication. If Emma tried to confront her, Melanie would retreat to her room or leave the house, closing herself off. Emma was at a loss, wondering desperately how to reconnect with her daughter, how to seek her forgiveness. Feeling like a stranger in her own home, Emma was overwhelmed. She couldn't focus on her daily tasks, consumed by the desire to embrace her daughter, to assure her of her love and support, 
to tell her that she wasn't angry and that she wouldn't abandon her. On an unplanned day off, Melanie, attempting to distract herself from thoughts of Jack, decided to tidy up her room. She delved into cleaning, washing the curtains, and scrubbing the windows. Little did she know that this seemingly mundane task would alter the course of things. As Melanie diligently washed the windows, her mother, Emma, happened to walk by. A casual glance into the room triggered a moment of panic in Emma's mind. She misinterpreted Melanie's actions, fearing that her daughter might be contemplating a desperate act, even though they lived on the fifth floor. Driven by a surge of anxiety, Emma swiftly rushed to Melanie, yanking her daughter away from the windowsill and pulling her into a tight embrace. Overwhelmed with relief and concern, Emma couldn't help but burst into tears, expressing both her fear and her deep-seated love for her daughter. In a moment fraught with emotion, Emma, gripped by panic and fear, pleaded with her daughter, Melanie. My darling, please don't do this, don't jump. Forgive me, I'm the old fool here. It's all my fault. I drove Jack away, telling him you were engaged and just playing with him. I thought I was protecting you, doing the right thing, but I see now, you're walking the same path I did. Emma's voice was heavy with regret as she continued, it's only now, seeing your unbearable pain, that I realize the grave mistake I've made. I've deprived my grandson of a father. But please know, I'm not angry with you. I love you. We'll raise your baby together. Just, please, don't harm yourself. Do you want me to help you find Jack, to forgive him? Melanie, stunned and tearful, faced her mother. Mom, what are you talking about? I wasn't going to jump. I was just cleaning the windows. But I'm glad you finally confessed. At first, I really hated you, I admit. But then I realized, if Jack truly loved me as much as I loved him, he would have sought me out, talked to me, tried to work things out. His silence and departure mean he wasn't the one. So don't blame yourself. And thank you for your support. Now, at least at home, I can find peace. For the first time in a long while, mother and daughter embraced, tears flowing freely. They cried not just from the pain but also from a sense of relief and liberation. The heavy burden of resentment, anger, and misunderstanding that had weighed on their hearts was finally lifted. The atmosphere in the room lightened, and it seemed as though both Emma and Melanie were finally able to breathe easier. Emma busied herself, heading to the kitchen to put the kettle on, while Melanie enjoyed sweet tea and crunched on a pickle. As they shared this moment, memories flooded back for Emma. She reminisced about her own pregnancy, recalling how she used to chew chalk wherever she found it. The shared laughter echoed a newfound camaraderie between them. Now, as Melanie approached the impending birth, Emma geared up, dusting off an old sewing machine from her youth. Rummaging through her trunk, Emma uncovered a length of soft face cloth. With a nostalgic smile, she began to share stories from her youth. Within a week, she tirelessly sewed diapers, undershirts, and tiny hats for the upcoming arrival. Washing and ironing them meticulously, she neatly stacked the handmade items. When Melanie returned from her shift and saw the carefully prepared gifts, she was stunned. Timidly taking the tiny sack in her hands and unwrapping it, tears welled up in her eyes. The simple, heartfelt gesture touched Melanie deeply, bridging the generational gap and creating a poignant connection between mother and daughter. Thank you, mom. It's heartwarming to think about the tiny hands the baby will have, just like a little doll. I'm still in disbelief. Mom sighed and replied. Yes, dear. We'll take turns at night. Initially, it might be hard, but we'll adjust. You can buy the stroller and crib secondhand, check the website. You'll receive maternity pay, enough for the first period. Maybe I'll be there with my grandchild, and you can consider a part-time or early job. That's okay, we'll manage. Melanie felt relieved knowing her mother's support. She could confide in her about worries. Yet, in the evening, sadness crept over Melanie. Memories of cuddling with Jack on the couch, watching a police soap opera, and falling asleep together lingered. His gentle touch, 
whispered words, and shared moments flooded her thoughts. Hey, Jack, how's everything? Where are you now? Perhaps you've traveled the world and forgotten about me long ago. How could you? I believed in you, didn't I? You'll never know that soon, you'll have a baby boy in the world. These thoughts consumed me, and I couldn't shake them off. But then, something happened that shook the town and turned my life upside down. All morning that day, I had a premonition. Something stirred in my soul, and my heart fluttered. I was confused throughout my shift, unable to comprehend what was happening. I almost made mistakes with the tests and almost took the wrong patient for an x-ray. The head nurse yelled at me all day. What's the matter with you? Pull yourself together, for God's sake. What's going to happen before maternity if you're already in the clouds? Think about work. When Melanie returned home from her shift, she was met with a motorcade of several fancy black limousines. Emma, surprised and watering the flowers on the windowsill, remarked, Look, daughter, what big shots have come to see someone. I've only seen cars like that in movies. I wonder who it's for, it seems that no rich people live in our house. Suddenly, the doorbell rang. Emma, still surprised, went to open the door, finding three bodyguards and one well-dressed, expensive young man standing on the doorstep. He smiled and asked, Good afternoon, Emma. Is Melanie at home? May I come in? The bewildered woman nodded and silently ushered the important guests inside, wondering who had come to visit. As the guests made their way into the hall, Melanie appeared. Suddenly, the young stylish man rushed up to her and threw himself into her arms, visibly excited. Hello, my love. Here I am, you're Jack. Are you glad I'm back? To the boy's surprise, Melanie angrily pushed him away and shouted, Who are you, Jack? Why do you want to come back all of a sudden? You gave me up so easily, believing what my mother told you. You didn't even bother to talk to me in person to find out whether it was true or not. Where have you been all this time? In space? On the moon? Why didn't you ever let me know? What is this limousine masquerade, or was it a masquerade and a vagabond image? Then who are you anyway? The guy looked sad, sat down on the couch, signaled for the others to leave the room, and began to explain, don't get hot, honey. Don't yell. Please, just listen to everything. Yes, you're right. I'm not a tramp. I'm the son of the millionaire Korshinov. You've probably heard of him. We have two airlines abroad. So, of course, I grew up in luxury and wealth. I went to an elite private school and then studied economics at a university in England. I felt like I had my whole life ahead of me. It was beautiful and amazing. I felt like I was wearing rose-colored glasses. And then, all of a sudden, I lose my mother. This, despite the fact that she was very carefully monitored, her health examined in the best clinics, and she led a completely healthy lifestyle. Can you imagine? She got out of her car and was walking to the supermarket when she was hit right there by a drunk driver. It was a terrible grief for our whole family. I remember the funeral vaguely, it seemed like it didn't happen to me at first. My dad grieved a lot, but he and I somehow bonded. Dealing with bereavement like that together made it easier. However, my father surprised me when six months after my mother's death, he brought that obnoxious stepmother, Nadeshta, into our house. I didn't get along with her right away. She had a lot of nerve, throwing out my mom's things and taking away her photo, although I expressly forbade her to do so. The result was a wild scandal. I thought my father would support me, but no, he sided with this scum and made me a condition, I either accept it or leave. It is unheard of, throwing your own son out of the house for some obnoxious woman. I couldn't get through to my father, it was like he couldn't hear me. It was as if Nadeshta had bewitched him. So, I lost my temper and ran away from home. Only, as it turned out, I was not at all adapted to life on the street. What had I seen before? A luxurious life, high society, everything in abundance.
I didn't even have any idea that people could starve, look for food in the garbage chute, and sleep on heating pipes. I imagined they were alcoholics and the dregs of society. I was so scared, wandering around without even taking my papers out of the house. I was stupid. That's when I realized, having talked to many of them, that the good half are ordinary people, often educated and well-read, just with a crippled fate. Meeting you, Melanie, was the brightest episode of my vagabonding life. When Emma kicked me out, I rushed in frustration to the station, jumped on a passing train, and ended up in Samara. There, I was habitually begging near the train station when all of a sudden, right out of nowhere, my father's motorcade appeared. It turned out that daddy was very ill, caught a cold, and went to the hospital with pneumonia. The doctors could barely save him, so the viper immediately went behind his back and started dividing his millions. She never once visited him in the hospital. That's when my father remembered that he had a son, felt ashamed, and decided to find me and apologize. We had lived together all the time before this woman came along, understanding each other at a glance. Anyway, my dad and I made up, and now I'm a manager at his company. I told my dad about you, Melanie, and he didn't mind us seeing each other. So, I came to pick you up. Come on, let's go to my place. I'll introduce you to your father, suggested Jack. Melanie sat there with a frown on her face, silent. Then suddenly, she asked, I'm not going anywhere, Jack. First of all, my mother is sick, and I won't leave her for long. And secondly, I'm pregnant. How does that sound? The guy's face changed. How? Pregnant? Excuse me, with who? Melanie couldn't take it anymore. She slapped him across the face and shouted, idiot, from my fiancé who was supposedly with me. Isn't that what you're implying? So you believe I'm a, sleeping with just anyone, huh? Go to hell then, go away with your millions. I hate you. Melanie ran to her room in tears. Furious, Jack jumped up, all right then, goodbye. You're hysterical. The whole procession left. Emma was clutching her heart, realizing that all this chaos was because of those stupid words of hers. She was the one who had planted seeds of doubt in Jack's head. And now, how to make it right? They could see that they loved each other but were angry and quarreled with each other as if they were enemies. Two weeks passed. Melanie was in a complete state of despair, sobbing day and night and scolding herself. Why did I do this to him? He came back, and I punched him in the face. Oh, I'm a fool, all because of my stupid pride. I should have snuggled up, kissed him, and told him how much I loved him, how much I missed him. What did I do? Now it's the end for sure. There's no way. Emma, determined to mend her mistakes, concocted a plan. She discovered where Korzanov lived and started preparing for her visit. To ensure Melanie wouldn't suspect anything, Emma fabricated a story. She told Melanie, I'm visiting an osteopath in the next town. The medical authorities there have a professor I'd like to consult with. Maybe I can avoid surgery. I'll show him all my tests and see what he says. Sure, go, mom. Can you handle it, or should I come with you for support? Melanie asked, concerned. Emma dismissively waved her hands. What are you thinking, my daughter? Why would you go with your morning sickness, traveling all that distance? It will be too much for you. No, stay at home, rest, and take care of my grandchild. And please, don't cry all the time. It breaks my heart to see you like this. With her story set, Emma embarked on her journey, carrying the weight of her responsibility to mend the rift she had inadvertently caused between Melanie and Jack. She hoped her actions could somehow bring them back together, healing the wounds of misunderstanding and misplaced anger. Overwhelmed by the grandeur of the capital, the elderly woman struggled to locate the Korjanov's countryside estate, having exhausted her last funds on an expensive hat. As dusk set in, the surrounding dense forests intensified her fear. Anxiety gripped Emma at the thought of being turned away, without any money left, 
how would she return? The journey to the nearest public transport was a daunting three kilometers. Bracing herself, she knocked at the gate. Loud barking from massive dogs echoed in the yard. A guard emerged from his booth, his expression one of reluctance. Who do you want? Is this the correct address? Emma took a deep breath and replied, Mr. Kors, I believe. It's important for me to speak with him or his son, Jack. I have a personal matter to discuss. She conveyed this to the guard, who radioed Alexander, the owner. On the other end, Alexander questioned, who is she? I don't know any woman. Emma, determined, introduced herself, the pensioner said, Emma, I'm Melanie's mother, Jack's fiancé. I won't leave until I speak with them. The guard relayed all this to Alexander, who sighed and finally agreed, well, take her to my office. I'll be right down. Emma cautiously entered the lavishly furnished office. Behind the desk sat a stern, imposing man wearing glasses. He gestured for her to sit down and then cleared his throat, asking, So, madam, what brings you here? Who did you mention you were? I didn't quite catch what the guard said, the man inquired. The woman replied, I am Emma, Melanie's mother. About four months ago, Melanie brought home a man, claiming he was her fiancé named Jack, and that he would be living with us. At first, I accepted it. Melanie's a reserved girl, having had only one previous boyfriend, Anton, a year ago. She's a good person, working as a nurse at our local hospital. But I digress. Initially, I was wholly against her relationship with Jack. They fell deeply in love, but I couldn't accept it. My daughter, intelligent and beautiful, with someone I considered a bum, it disturbed me deeply. I've had a tough life myself and didn't want Melanie to suffer similarly. In my spite, I fabricated stories, and now Jack is doubtful. I don't know what to do. We don't seek anything from you, we're not that kind of people. We'll manage on our own, but I needed to apologize to your son and clarify that what I told him was untrue. Melanie hasn't been with anyone else. I regret causing trouble between two people who love each other because of me. And I'm concerned about my grandson, who might grow up not knowing his father. Please pass this message to Jack. Also, if you could arrange for me to get to the train station, I must return home. Melanie is unaware of my visit here and will worry, especially since she can't know. The man slowly removed his glasses, twirling them in his hands, pondering her words. Ah, so that's the situation. I'm going to be a grandfather soon, huh? Jack, he really does manage to keep himself busy, doesn't he? Well, I've got the picture now, more or less. And here I was thinking he's been sulking around like a storm cloud for no reason. Don't worry, I'll have a word with my son. Our chauffeur will take you home in a comfortable car, it's just an hour's drive. Emma sighed with relief, expressing her gratitude, thank you for not dismissing me, for listening and understanding. It's clear you're a calm and reasonable man, not impulsive like us, first creating chaos, then trying to sort it out. With a lighter heart, Emma headed home, her conscience eased by her effort to reconcile Jack and Melanie and atone for her missteps. When Jack returned from work, exhaustion was written all over him, his mind set only on sleep. However, he couldn't rest just yet. His father was waiting for him in the hallway, bearing that familiar, stern look from Jack's childhood, eyebrows knitted, glasses perched on the bridge of his nose, signaling a serious conversation ahead. And a serious conversation it was. Alexander began to speak to his son, ready to unravel the day's revelations. Alexander led Jack into the study, signaling the need for a serious discussion. Jack, weary and perplexed, followed, wondering what he might be in trouble for this time. As they settled in the office, Alexander began sternly, What's going on, Jack? My son, involved in scandal, and I'm the last to know. Jack was taken aback, What's the matter, Dad? The company? The contracts? But Alexander was focused on a different issue, it's about a woman, Emma, who came here today. She was distraught, seeking your forgiveness. 
She told me you got her daughter, Melanie, pregnant. What's this all about, Jack? If it's true, why haven't you dealt with it? Is hiding away the responsible thing to do? Jack's demeanor changed to one of defeat and confusion. I don't know, Dad. Melanie is wonderful, kind, and I truly love her. She was there for me when I had nowhere else to go. But her mother. She's been nothing but trouble. She constantly told me I wasn't right for Melanie and then claimed Melanie was just toying with me and had another fiancé. I felt so hurt and betrayed. Last week, I tried to reconcile with Melanie, but instead of welcoming me, she slapped me. All because I asked who the father of her child was. The situation was clearly complex, with misunderstandings and hurt feelings on all sides. Alexander listened, understanding the gravity of the situation and the need for a careful resolution. Jack's father shook his head in dismay. Oh Jack, you fool, he lamented, I'd really like to give you a good shake right now. Firstly, how could you just blindly trust some idle gossip without verifying it? You should have waited to speak directly with Melanie. And secondly, consider this. What would the majority of women do if they knew you were the son of a millionaire? They'd likely be all over you, right? But what did your girl do? She showed you the door, didn't she? What does that tell you? It says she isn't swayed by money or status. She values honesty, and isn't afraid to stand up for what she believes in, even if it means going against her mother's wishes. That's genuine love, Jack. Jack felt a pang of regret. You're right, Dad. Why didn't I see this before? I've been torturing myself from the inside. I'm so deeply in love with her, but I don't even know who I'm jealous of. I just feel so lost without her. She's become a part of me. Since meeting Melanie, no one else matters. But what do I do now? She's a proud woman, and I doubt she'll forgive me easily. His father, Alexander, laughed in response. You've been such a fool, her mother scolded Jack. Your fiancé has been in agony, crying day and night. She's been drowning in her own tears, and you think she won't forgive you? Just talk to her, sincerely. Embrace her, ask her to marry you. No woman could reject such a heartfelt plea. And think about it, you're depriving your grandfather of his grandchild. Elated and hopeful, Jack bought scarlet roses and a large German cake Melanie had always wanted to try. He hurried back to her house, ringing the doorbell with a mix of eagerness and apprehension. Melanie's mother appeared, looking unwell, her steps unsteady. Good afternoon, Emma. Is Melanie here? I need to talk to her, Jack said anxiously. Tears welled up in her mother's eyes. Oh, Jack. They rushed Melanie to the hospital about half an hour ago. She was in so much pain, bleeding. They thought it might be a miscarriage. It's all this stress, it's breaking her down. I wanted to go with her, but my blood pressure skyrocketed to 200. The doctor advised me to stay. I'll visit her tomorrow morning. I just hope she's okay. Jack felt a wave of guilt and fear. I'll never forgive myself if anything happens to her, he thought, consumed by worry and regret. Jack's face turned pale as fear gripped him. What a fool I am, this is all my fault. Quick, what hospital is she in? Give me the address. He sped off, racing through the streets, his mind a blur of worry and guilt. Upon arriving at the emergency room, his presence caused a stir among the nurses. Jack the son of the famous Korjanov, was instantly recognizable from the numerous advertising banners and magazine covers he had graced. His arrival was not an everyday occurrence. In a near panic, Jack almost shouted, where is Melanie Nesterov? What room is she in? What's happened to her? Where's the doctor in charge? She's my fiancé. The hospital staff hurried about, a buzz of activity triggered by his urgency. Everyone began addressing him as, Jack. Soon, a weary, elderly doctor emerged from the residence room, his expression stern. What are you doing here? 
this is a maternity hospital, not a marketplace. Melanie Nesterov is in Ward 5. The situation is frankly critical. She's experiencing severe bleeding and there's a threat of miscarriage. We're doing everything we can. Are you the father of the child? Can you give blood? It would really help her right now, she's losing a lot, the doctor asked urgently. Jack nodded vehemently, anything, as long as Melanie and the baby are okay. I'll pay for the most expensive medication. I'm begging you, let me see her for a second. I need to tell her something. When she hears it, things will get better, I assure you, Jack pleaded. The doctor hesitated, initially inclined to refuse. However, he looked into Jack's eyes, filled with pain and despair, and changed his mind. Okay, just a couple of minutes. I'll wait for you in the manipulation room. Quietly, Jack entered the room. Melanie lay frightened and pale, barely seeming to breathe. Paramedics were bustling around her, administering shots and a drip of medicine. Jack walked up to her, got down on one knee, and whispered, his voice filled with both love and concern. Hello, my little tit. Forgive me, fool. I love you very much, more than life. Don't say anything, take care of your strength and take care of our baby. Let me put my hand on his belly, may I? Jack gently placed his hand on her lower belly, stroking it softly. He whispered, my little sonny, it's me, your daddy. Don't give your mom a hard time. We love you, and we're waiting for you right on time, strong and healthy. A nurse appeared at the door, signaling that it was time to go. Jack kissed Melanie gently and left. Unimaginable emotions stirred within her soul. Just an hour ago, she had wanted to die, indifferent to what happened next. Now, warmth, happiness, and incredible light filled her being. She yearned to live, to love Jack, and to raise their son. Closing her eyes, she fell asleep with the certainty that everything would be alright. She wasn't alone, Jack was with her. He had given blood, staying awake all night, praying fervently in the lobby. As best he could, Lord, take away everything, the money, the company, the cars. Just let Melanie and the baby get well. I'd rather be sick than see something happen to them. I love them so much. In the morning, a touch on the shoulder roused Jack from his thoughts. It was the same tired doctor, now changed and ready to head home. He looked at Jack with a mixture of sympathy and concern. Jack, there's good news. Your fiancé is stable. We managed to stop the bleeding, and the threat of miscarriage has been averted. However, she'll need to stay with us for another week for monitoring. In the future, you must be more careful. Avoid stress and overworking. Take good care of her. Women in her condition are particularly vulnerable. The doctor's words brought a wave of relief to Jack. The fear and uncertainty that had gripped him were now replaced by a newfound resolve to care for Melanie and their unborn child with all the love and attention they deserved. Ecstatic with the positive news, Jack eagerly extended his gratitude to the doctor. Thank you, thank God it all worked out. If anything had happened to Melanie or the baby, I wouldn't have forgiven myself ever. Anxious to see Melanie, Jack asked, can I see her now? However, the doctor replied sternly, visiting hours are posted in the waiting room. No breaking of rules, these are written for everyone. Is that clear? Determined to ensure Melanie's comfort, Jack arranged for a private room with a TV. Melanie, though still in recovery, now had a more comfortable space. Jack spent every available minute by her side, giving her massages, gently stroking her tummy, and showering her with fruits, juices, and vitamins. Melanie's mom also contributed with regular homemade borscht and steamed cutlets, which Melanie couldn't get enough of. The love and care surrounding Melanie helped speed up her recovery and brought a sense of joy and relief to both Jack and her. Jack chuckled affectionately at Melanie's comment. Jack, you're going to feed me so much I'll be as chubby as Winnie the Pooh. But the toxicosis is gone, and I've got a wolf's appetite. I'm eating like crazy. 
Once Melanie was discharged from the hospital, despite her protests, Jack moved her to his mansion. He and his father also took special care of Emma, Melanie's mother. Recognizing her need for rest and recuperation, they arranged for her treatment at a sanitarium, covering a month's stay. For Emma, this was a dream come true. In all her life, Emma had never truly taken a vacation. Whenever she had time off from work, she always sought part-time jobs, year after year, never having enough money to indulge in luxuries like resorts. But now, at the sanatorium located by the seashore, with beautiful scenery and staff treating her like royalty, Emma felt like an important guest. She was, after all, the sister-in-law of the Korsanov family. Emma spent her days walking, taking photographs against the backdrop of mountains and the beach, and sending these pictures to her girlfriends, who were green with envy. The news about her luxurious stay and connection to the Korsanov family became the talk of the entire neighborhood. This gesture from Jack and his father not only brought joy and health to Emma but also strengthened the bond within their soon-to-be extended family. Observe how fortunate Emma is in her later years, she's enjoying a vacation fit for royalty and receiving complimentary medical care. Meanwhile, Melanie, who has been the subject of much gossip and criticism, seems to have proven her detractors wrong. She had an unfortunate start with a troublesome partner, reminiscent of a classic fairy tale. Melanie, preparing for maternity leave from her job, organized a farewell dinner in the company's lounge on her last day. She brought cakes, juice, fruit, and champagne for her colleagues. The atmosphere was different now, the same people who once ridiculed and harassed her were now eager to win her favor, possibly fearing she might report them to her influential father-in-law. Away from the city, Melanie relished her time in the countryside. She enjoyed the fresh air, leisurely strolls on shaded paths, and peaceful moments in a gazebo. As her pregnancy progressed, she became more radiant, with rosy cheeks and a noticeably growing belly, resembling a large watermelon. Jack, her partner, treated her with utmost care and attention, thrilled about the impending arrival of their baby. He had meticulously planned with a top-tier clinic for the birth, constantly checking on Melanie's well-being to avoid any further stress or complications. Alexander, not one to be idle, was also making preparations. He ordered new furniture and set up a luxurious nursery. However, he kept these arrangements hidden from the younger family members, superstitiously fearing it might bring bad luck. Emma's recovery was remarkable. After her treatment, her health had significantly improved, astonishing the medical professionals. During a follow-up visit at the clinic, the doctors were impressed by her recovery, finding that all her health indicators had shown considerable improvement. Emma, you should consider getting married now. I'll happily recommend the sanatorium to all my patients, suggested someone excitedly. Meanwhile, during Melanie's last ultrasound with her partner before the birth, there was an unexpected revelation. Harry, with a sly smile, initiated the conversation. Melanie, I can see that your love life is flourishing. Is that your husband? You look great, remarked Harry. Melanie blushed and confirmed, yes, this is Jack, the father of my baby. We're doing well. Harry then dropped a bombshell, I have amazing news for you both. Sit down just in case. Jack, visibly nervous, stammered, is it about the baby? Speak up, don't keep us waiting. The revelation left them both stunned. Harry delivered the news with a flourish, you have twins, a boy and a girl. Congratulations. Melanie, wide-eyed, exclaimed, twins. How is that possible? I've had three ultrasounds, and you never mentioned twins. Harry explained, I've seen it all. I just didn't want to scare you until later. Would you have agreed not to terminate the pregnancy if I had told you earlier? You were scared and crying all the time, weren't you? Jack, now jumping for joy, exclaimed, two kids at the same time. That's great. We'll head off right away. Melanie, still in shock, managed to reply, yes, it won't be boring, that's for sure. The unexpected news added a new layer of excitement and surprise to their journey into parenthood. 
Indeed, that's correct. The unexpected news of twins caught everyone by surprise. Melanie, reflecting on her pregnancy, wondered, why is my little boy so active, and why is my belly as big as two watermelons? It made sense now, there were two babies. Concerned about the delivery, she asked, will I be able to give birth naturally, or will I need a cesarean section? The gynecologist, understanding her worries, reassured her with a laugh. Here we go, the usual fears. Of course, you'll give birth naturally. All your health indicators are normal, and your pelvis is wide enough. Don't worry. However, you'll need to come to the hospital a week earlier, as twins often lead to earlier and quicker labor. Everyone at home was astonished by the news. Emma, in her relief, thought to herself, thank goodness Melanie and Jack reconciled. I can't imagine how we would have managed two babies together. A contented Melanie snuggled up to Jack, reminiscing, when I first saw you at the crosswalk, I immediately felt you were my destiny. And I was right. Jack, reflecting on their journey, kissed Melanie and shared his thoughts, I've often thought about how things would have been different if I hadn't argued with my father and ended up in that underpass. I don't regret meeting you at all. My only regret is that I was foolish and caused you so much stress, almost risking our babies. I'm sorry. Now I know, no matter the situation, we should always sit down and talk. We have a lot to learn as our family is just starting, but we have our whole lives to do it. Their conversation marked a new chapter in their lives, filled with understanding, growth, and the joy of their expanding family. As Melanie approached the end of her pregnancy, her visibility dwindled, with her massive belly obstructing her view. Jack anxiously paced the hospital corridor, his hands ringing in worry, while Emma, equally concerned, prayed fervently as she gazed at her daughter-in-law's protruding belly. Alexander, baffled by the birthing process, marveled at how women could endure such an experience, let alone giving birth to two children simultaneously. Fortunately, everything went smoothly. Melanie, trusting Harry implicitly, insisted that he be the one to deliver the babies. She believed in his expertise and knew he wouldn't make any mistakes. When she was finally handed two squirming, wet, and exhausted babies, she couldn't contain her happiness, shedding tears of joy. In that moment, Melanie felt like the happiest woman on earth. Harry, leaning over to her, slyly recalled the promise he made, that when she became a mother, the overwhelming happiness would diminish the significance of other problems and difficulties. Melanie, smiling blissfully, admitted, 20% right. Thank you, Harry, for everything. You're more than a doctor, you're like a father to me during this time. Thank you so much. At the christening of Vivian and William, a joyful crowd gathered, including press reporters, Harry, and familiar faces. It became a celebration for the entire world. Everyone marveled at the little angels in the crib, extending well wishes and happiness to the newly expanded family. The event marked a moment of joy and blessings for all those present.